Chapter 18 of When the Holy Ghost is Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. When the Holy Ghost is Come by Samuel Logan Bringall. Chapter 18 The Holy Spirit's Call to the Work. The Holy Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me. Isaiah 61, 1 is the testimony of the workman God sends. God chooses his own workman, and it is the office of the Holy Spirit to call whom he will to preach the gospel. I doubt not he calls men to other employments for his glory, and would still more often do so if men would but listen and wait upon him to know his will. He called Bezalel and Oholiab to build the tabernacle. He called and commissioned the Gentile king Cyrus to rebuild Jerusalem and restore his chastised and humbled people to their own land. And did he not call Joan of Arc to her strange and wonderful mission, and Washington and Lincoln? And no doubt he leads most men by his providence to their life work. But the call to preach the gospel is more than a providential leading. It is a distinct and imperative conviction. Bishop Simpson, in his Lectures on Preaching, says, Even in the faintest form there is this distinction between a call to the ministry and a choice of other professions. A young man may wish to be a physician. He may desire to enter the Navy. He would like to be a farmer, but he feels he ought to be a minister. It is this feeling of ought or obligation which in its feeblest form indicates the divine call. It is not the aptitude, taste, or desire, but in the conscience, that its root is found. It is the voice of God to the human conscience, saying, You ought to preach. Sometimes the call comes as distinctly as though a voice had spoken from the skies into the depths of the heart. A young man who was studying law was converted. After a while he was convicted for sanctification, and while seeking he heard, as it were, a voice saying, Will you devote all your time to the Lord? He replied, I am to be a lawyer, not a preacher, Lord. But not until he said, Yes, Lord, could he find the blessing. A thoughtless, godless young fellow was working in the cornfield when a telegram was handed him announcing the death of his brother a brilliant and devoted Salvation Army field officer. And there and then, unsaved as he was, God called him, showed him a vast army with ranks broken, where his brother had fallen, and made him to feel that he should fill the breach in the ranks. Fourteen months later he took up the sword and entered the fight from the same platform from which his brother fell, and is today one of our most successful and promising field officers. Again, the call may come as a quiet suggestion, a gentle conviction, as though a gossamer bridle were placed upon the heart and conscience to guide the man into the work of the Lord. The suggestion gradually becomes clearer, the conviction strengthens until it masters the man, and if he seeks to escape it, he finds the silken bridle to be of the stoutest thongs and firmest steel. It was so with me. When but a boy of eleven I heard a man preaching, and I said to myself, Oh, how beautiful to preach! Two years later I was converted, and soon the conviction came upon me that I should preach. Later I decided to follow another profession. But the conviction increased in strength, while I struggled against it, and turned away my ears and went on with my studies. Yet in every crisis, or hour of stillness, when my soul faced God, the conviction that I must preach burned itself deeper into my conscience. I rebelled against it. I felt I would almost rather, but not quite, go to hell than to submit. Then at last a great woe is me if I preach not the gospel took possession of me, and I yielded, and God won. Hallelujah! The first year he gave me three revivals with many souls, and now I would rather preach Jesus to poor sinners and feed his lambs than to be an archangel before the throne. Some day, some day, he will call me into his blessed presence, and I shall stand before his face and praise him forever for counting me worthy and calling me to preach his glad gospel 
and share in his joy of saving the lost the woe is lost in love and delight through the baptism of the spirit and the sweet assurance that jesus is pleased occasionally the call comes to a man who is ready and responds promptly and gladly when isaiah received the fiery touch that purged his life and purified his heart he heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us and in the joy and power of his new experience he cried out here am i send me isaiah six five through eight when paul received his call he says immediately i conferred not with flesh and blood galatians one sixteen and he got up and went as the lord led him but more often it seems the lord finds men preoccupied with other plans and ambitions or encompassed with obstacles and difficulties or oppressed with a deep sense of unworthiness and unfitness moses argued that he could not talk o oh lord he said i am not eloquent neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant but i am slow of speech and of a slow tongue and then the lord condescended as he always does to reason with the backward man who hath made man's mouth he asks or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind have not i the lord now therefore go and i will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say exodus four ten through twelve when the call of god came to jeremiah he shrank back and said ah oh, lord god behold i cannot speak for i am a child but the lord replied say not i am a child for thou shalt go to all that i shall send thee and whatsoever i command thou shalt speak be not afraid of their faces for i am with thee to deliver thee jeremiah one six through eight and so the call of god comes to-day to those who shrink and feel that they are most unfit or most hedged in by insuperable difficulties i know a man who when converted could not tell a from b he knew nothing whatever about the bible and stammered so badly that when asked his own name it would usually take him a minute or so to tell it added to this he lisped badly and was subject to a nervous affliction which seemed likely to unfit him for any kind of work whatever but god poured light and love into his heart called him to preach and to-day he is one of the mightiest soul winners in the whole round of my acquaintance when he speaks the house is always packed to the doors and the people hang on his words with wonder and joy he was converted at a camp meeting and sanctified wholly in a cornfield he learned to read but being too poor to afford a light in the evening he studied a large print bible by the light of the full moon Today he has the Bible almost committed to memory, and when he speaks he does not open the book, but reads his lessons from memory, and quotes proof texts from Genesis to Revelation, without mistake, and gives chapter and verse for every quotation. When he talks his face shines, and his speech is like honey for sweetness, and like bullets fired from a gun for power. He is one of the weak and foolish ones God has chosen to confound the wise and mighty. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. If God calls a man, he will so corroborate the call in some way that men may know that there is a prophet among them. It will be with him as it was with Samuel. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. 1 Samuel 3, 19 and 20 if the man himself is uncertain about the call god will deal patiently with him as he did with gideon to make him certain his fleece will be wet with dew when the earth is dry or dry when the earth is wet or he will hear of some tumbling barley cake smiting the tents of midian that will strengthen his faith and make him to know that god is with him judges six thirty six to forty seven nine to fifteen if the door is shut and difficulties hedge the way god will go before the man he calls and open the door and sweep away the difficulties isaiah forty five two to three 
if others think the man so ignorant and unfit that they doubt his call god will give him such grace or such power to win souls that they shall have to acknowledge that god has chosen him it was in this way that god made the whole national headquarters from the commissioner downwards to know that he had chosen the elevator boy for his work the boy got scores of his passengers on the elevator saved and then he was commissioned and sent into the field to devote all his time to saving men the lord will surely let the man's comrades and brethren know as surely as he did the church at antioch when when the holy ghost said separate me barnabas and saul for the work whereunto i have called them acts thirteen two sometimes the one who is called will try to hide it in his heart and then god stirs up some officer or minister some soldier or mother in israel to lay a hand on his shoulders and ask are you not called to the work and he finds he cannot hide himself nor escape from the call any more than could adam hide himself from god behind the trees of the garden or jonah escape god's call by taking ship for tarshish happy is the man who does not try to escape but though trembling at the mighty responsibility assumes it and with all humility and faithfulness sets to work by prayer and patient continuous study of god's word to fit himself for god's work he will need to prepare himself for the call to the work is a call to preparation continuous preparation of the fullest possible kind the man whom god calls cannot safely neglect or despise the call he will find his mission on earth his happiness and peace his power and prosperity his reward in heaven and probably heaven itself bound up with that call and dependent upon it he may run away from it as did jonah and find a waiting ship to favor his flight but he will also find fierce storms and bellowing seas overtaking him and big-mouthed fishes of trouble and disaster ready to swallow him but if he heeds the call and cheerfully goes where god appoints god will go with him he shall never more be left alone the holy spirit will surely accompany him and he may be one of the happiest men on earth one of the gladdest creatures in god's universe lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world said jesus as he commissioned his disciples to go to all nations and preach the gospel my presence shall go with thee said jehovah to moses when sending him to face pharaoh and free israel and lead them to the promised land and to the boy jeremiah he said be not afraid of their faces for i am with thee to deliver thee and they shall fight against thee but they shall not prevail against thee for i am with thee jeremiah one eight and nineteen i used to read these words with a great rapturous joy as i realized by faith that they were also meant for me and for every man sent of god and that his blessed presence was with me every time i spoke to the people or dealt with an individual soul or knelt in prayer with a penitent seeker after god and i still read them so has he called you into the work my brother and are you conscious of his helpful sympathizing loving presence with you if so let no petty offence no hardship nor danger nor dread of the future cause you to turn aside or draw back stick to the work till he calls you out and when he so calls you can go with open face and a heart abounding with love joy and peace and he will still go with you End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of When the Holy Ghost is Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. When the Holy Ghost is Come by Samuel Logan Brinkle. Chapter 19 the sheathed sword a law of the spirit just as the moss and the oak are higher in the order of creation than the clod of clay and the rock the bird and beast than the moss and the oak the man than the bird and the beast so the spiritual man is a higher being than the natural man the sons of god are a new order of being the christian is a new creation 
just as there are laws governing the life of the plant and other and higher laws that of the bird and beast so there are higher laws for man and still higher for the christian it was with regard to one of these higher laws that govern the heavenly life of the christian that jesus said to peter put up thy sword jesus said to pilate my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world then would my servants fight the natural man is a fighter it is the law of his carnal nature he fights with fist and sword tongue and wit his kingdom is of this world and he fights for it with such weapons as this world furnishes the christian is a citizen of heaven and is subject to its law which is universal wholehearted love in his kingdom he conquers not by fighting but by submitting when an enemy takes his coat he overcomes him not by going to law but by generously giving him his cloak also when his enemy compels him to go a mile with him he vanquishes the enemy by cheerfully going two miles with him when he is smitten on one cheek he wins his foe by meekly turning the other cheek this is the law of the new life from heaven and only by recognizing and obeying it can that new life be sustained and passed on to others this is the narrow way which leads to life eternal and few there be that find it or finding it are willing to walk in it a russian peasant sutajev could get no help from the religious teachers of his village so he learned to read and while studying the bible he found this narrow way and walked gladly in it one night neighbors of his stole some of his grain but in their haste or carelessness they left a bag he found it and ran after them to restore it for said he fellows who have to steal must be hard up and by this christ-like spirit he saved both himself and them for he kept the spirit of love in his own heart and they were converted and became his most ardent disciples a beggar woman to whom he gave lodging stole the bedding and ran away with it she was pursued by the neighbors and was just about to be put in prison when Sutajev appeared, became her advocate, secured her acquittal, and gave her food and money for her journey. He recognized the law of his new life and gladly obeyed it, and so was not overcome of evil, but persistently and triumphantly overcame evil with good. Romans 12:21. This is the spirit and method of Jesus, and by men filled with this spirit and following this method, he will yet win the world. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. His spirit is not one of self-seeking, but of self-sacrifice. Some mysterious majesty of his presence, or voice, so awed and overcame his foes that they went back and fell to the ground before him in the garden of his agony. But he meekly submitted himself to them. And when Peter laid to with his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Jesus said to him, put up thy sword into the sheath the cup which my father hath given me shall i not drink it this was the spirit of isaac when he digged a well the philistines strove with his servants for it so he digged another and when they strove for that he removed and digged yet another and for that they strove not and he called the name of it rehoboth room and he said for now the lord hath made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land and the lord appeared unto him the same night and said i am the god of abraham thy father fear not for i am with thee i will bless thee and multiply thy seed genesis twenty six twenty two and twenty four this was the spirit of david when saul was hunting for his life twice david could have slain him and when urged to do so he said as the lord liveth the lord shall smite him or his day shall come to die or he shall descend into battle and perish the lord forbid that i should stretch forth my hand against the lord's anointed first samuel twenty six ten and eleven this was the spirit of paul he says being reviled we bless being persecuted we suffer it being defamed we entreat first corinthians four twelve and thirteen 
the servant of the lord must not strive wrote paul to timothy but be gentle unto all men this is the spirit of our king this is the law of his kingdom is this your spirit when you are reviled bemeaned and slandered and are tempted to retort he says to you put up thy sword into the sheath when you are wronged and ill-treated and men ride roughshod over you and you feel it but just to smite back he says put up thy sword into the sheath live peaceably with all men your weapons are not carnal but spiritual now that you belong to him and have your citizenship in heaven if you fight with the sword if you retort and smite back when you are wrong you quench the spirit you get out of the narrow way and your new life from heaven will perish an officer went to a hard core and after a while found that his predecessor was sending back to friends for money which his own corps much needed he felt it to be an injustice and losing sight of the spirit of jesus he made a complaint about it and the money was returned but he got lean in his soul he had quenched the spirit he had broken the law of the kingdom he had not only refused to give his cloak but had fought for and secured the return of the coat he had lost the smile of jesus and his poor heart was sad and heavy within him he came to me with anxious inquiry as to what I thought of his action. I had to admit that the other man had transgressed, and that the money ought to be returned, but that he should have been more grieved over the uncrushed like spirit of his brother than over the loss of the five dollars, and that like Sutajeff he should have said, Poor fellow, he must be hard up, I will send him five dollars myself. He has taken my coat, he shall have my cloak too. When I told him that story, he came to himself very quickly, and was soon back in the narrow way, and rejoicing in the smile of Jesus once again. But will not people walk over us, if we do not stand up for our rights, you ask? I do not argue that you are not to stand up for your rights, but that you are to stand up for your higher rather than your lower rights, the rights of your heavenly life rather than your earthly life and that you are to stand up for your rights in the way and spirit of Jesus, rather than in the way and spirit of the world. If men wrong you intentionally, they wrong themselves far worse than they wrong you. And if you have the spirit of Jesus in your heart, you will pity them more than you pity yourself. They nailed Jesus to the cross and hung him up to die. They gave him gall and vinegar to drink. They cast votes for his seamless robe and divided his garments between them, while the crowd wagged their heads at him and mocked him. Great was the injustice and wrong they were inflicting upon him, but he was not filled with anger, only pity. He thought not of the wrong done him, but of the wrong they did themselves, and their sin against his heavenly Father, and he prayed not for judgment upon them, but that they might be forgiven, and he won them, and is winning and will win the world bless god by mercy and truth iniquity is purged wrote solomon put up thy sword into the sheath and take mercy and truth for your weapons and god will be with you and for you and great shall be your victory and joy hallelujah end of chapter nineteen Chapter 20 of When the Holy Ghost is Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. When the Holy Ghost is Come by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter 20 Victory Through the Holy Spirit Over Suffering. Had there been no sin, our Heavenly Father would have found other means by which to develop in us passive virtues, and train us in the graces of meekness, patience, long-suffering, and forbearance, which so beautify and display the Christian character. But since sin is here, with its contradictions and falsehoods, its darkness, its wars, brutalities, and injustices, producing awful harvests of pain and sorrow, God, in wonderful wisdom and loving-kindness, 
turns even these into instruments by which to fashion in us beautiful graces. Storm succeeds sunshine, and darkness the light. Pain follows hard on the heels of pleasure, while sorrow peers over the shoulder of joy. Gladness and grief, rest and toil, peace and war, interminably intermingled, follow each other in ceaseless succession in this world. We cannot escape suffering while in the body. But we can receive it with a faith that robs it of its terror, and extracts from it richest blessing. From the flinty rock will gush forth living waters, and the carcass of the lion will furnish the sweetest honey. This is so even when the suffering is a result of our own folly or sin. It is intended not only in some measure as a punishment, but also as a teacher, a corrective, a remedy, a warning. And it will surely work for good if, instead of repining and vainly regretting the past, we steadily look unto Jesus and learn our lesson in patience and thankfulness. If all the skies were sunshine, our faces would be fain to feel once more upon them the cooling plash of rain. If all the world were music, our hearts would often long for one sweet strain of silence to break the endless song. If life were always merry, our souls would seek relief and rest from weary laughter in the quiet arms of grief. Doubtless all our suffering is a result of sin, but not necessarily the sin of the sufferer. Jesus was the sinless one, but he was also the chief of sufferers. Paul's great and lifelong sufferings came upon him, not because of his sins, but rather because he had forsaken sin, and was following Jesus in a world of sin, and seeking the salvation of his fellows. In this path there is no escape from suffering, though there are hidden and unspeakable consolations. In the world ye shall have tribulation, said Jesus. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, wrote Paul. Sooner or later, suffering in some form comes to each of us. It may come through broken health, or pain and weariness of body, or through mental anguish, moral distress, spiritual darkness and uncertainty. It may come through the loss of loved ones, through betrayal by trusted friends, or through deferred or ruined hopes or base ingratitude or perhaps in unrequited toil and sacrifice and ambitions all unfulfilled. Nothing more clearly distinguishes the man filled with the Spirit from the man who is not than the way each receives suffering. One, with triumphant faith and shining face and strong heart, glories in tribulation, and counts it all joy. To this class belong the apostles, who, beaten and threatened, departed from the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5.41 the other, with doubts and fears, murmurs and complains, and to his other miseries adds that of a rebellious heart and discontented mind. One sees the enemy's armed host and unmixed distress and danger. The other sees the angel of the Lord, with abundant succor and safety. Second Kings six fifteen through 17 An evangelist of my acquaintance told a story that illustrates this. When a pastor... He went one morning to visit two sisters who were greatly afflicted. They were about the same age, and had long been professing Christians and members of the church. He asked the first one upon whom he called, "'How is it with you this morning?' "'Oh, I have not slept all night,' she replied. "'I have so much pain. It is so hard to have to lie here. I cannot see why God deals so with me.' Evidently she was not filled with the Spirit, but was in a controversy with the Lord about her sufferings, and would not be comforted. Leaving her, he called immediately upon the other sister, and asked, "'How are you today?' "'Oh, I had such a night of suffering,' she replied. "'Then,' said he, "'there came out upon her worn face, furrowed and pale, a beautiful radiance, and she added, "'But Jesus was so near and helped me so, that I could suffer this way and more if my father thinks best.' And on she went with like words of cheer and triumph that made the sick room a vestibule of glory. No lack of comfort in her heart, for the Comforter himself, the Holy Spirit had been invited and had come in. One had the Comforter in fullness, the other had not. Probably no man ever suffered more than Paul, but with soldier-like fortitude he bore his heavy burdens, faced his constant and exacting labors, endured his sore trials, disappointments, and bitter persecutions by fierce and relentless enemies. He stood unmoved amid shipwrecks, stripes and imprisonments, cold, hunger and homelessness without a whimper that might suggest repining or discouragement, or an appeal for pity. Indeed, he went beyond simple uncomplaining fortitude, and said, 
We glory in tribulation. Romans 5, 3. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. After a terrible scourging upon his bare back, he was thrust into a loathsome inner dungeon, his feet fast in the stocks, with worse things probably awaiting him on the morrow. Nevertheless, we find him and Silas, his companion in suffering, at midnight praying and singing praises unto God. Acts sixteen twenty five. What is his secret? Listen to him. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Romans 5, 5. His prayer for his Ephesian brethren had been answered in his own heart. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And this inner strength and consciousness, through faith in an indwelling Christ, enabled him to receive suffering and trial, not stoically, as the Red Indian, nor hilariously in a spirit of bravado, but cheerfully and with a thankful heart. Arnold of Rugby has written something about his most dear and blessed sister that illustrates the power flowing from exhaustless fountains of inner joy and strength through the working of the Holy Spirit. He says, I never saw a more perfect instance of the spirit and power of love and of a sound mind. Her life was a daily martyrdom for twenty years, during which she adhered to her early formed resolution of never talking about herself. She was thoughtful about the very pins and ribbons of my wife's dress, about the making of a doll's cap for a child, but of herself, save only as regarded her ripening in all goodness, wholly thoughtless, enjoying everything lovely, graceful, beautiful, high-minded, whether in God's works or man's, with the keenest relish, inheriting the earth to the very fullness of the promise, though never leaving her crib nor changing her posture, and preserved, through the very valley of the shadow of death, from all fear or impatience and from every cloud of impaired reason, which might mar the beauty of Christ's and the Spirit's work. It is not by hypnotizing the soul, nor by blessing it into a state of ecstatic insensibility, that the Lord enables the man filled with the Spirit to thus triumph over suffering. Rather, it is by giving the soul a sweet, constant, and unshaken assurance through faith, first, that it is freely and fully accepted in Christ, second, that whatever suffering comes, it is measured, weighed, and permitted by love infinitely tender, and guided by wisdom that cannot err. Third, that however difficult it may be to explain suffering now, it is nevertheless one of the all things which work together for good to them that love God, and that in a little while it will not only be swallowed up in the ineffable blessedness and glory, but that in some way it is actually helping to work out a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 Fourth, that though the furnace has been heated seven times hotter than was wont, yet the form, like unto the Son of God, is walking with us in the fire. Though triumphant enemies have thrust us into the lion's den, yet the angel of the Lord arrived first, and locked the lion's jaws. Though foes may have formed against us sharp weapons, yet they cannot prosper, for his shield and buckler defend us. Though all things be lost, yet thou remainest, and though my flesh and my heart may fail, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Not all God's dear children thus triumph over their difficulties and sufferings, but this is God's standard, and they may attain unto it, if by faith they will open their hearts and be filled with the Spirit. Here is the testimony of a Salvation Army officer up to date. Viewed from the outside, my life as a sinner was easy and untroubled, over which most of my friends expressed envy while these same friends thought my life as a Christian full of care, toil, hardship, and immense loss. This, however, was only an outside view, and the real state of the case was exactly the opposite of what they supposed. For in all the pleasure-seeking, idleness, and freedom from responsibility of my life apart from God, I carried an immeasurable burden of fear, anxiety, and constantly recurring disappointment. Trifles weighed upon me, and the thought of death haunted me with vague terrors. But when I gave myself wholly to God, though my lot became at once one of toil, responsibility, comparative poverty, and sacrifice, yet I could not feel pain in any storm that broke over my head, because of the presence of God. It was not so much that I was insensible to trouble, as sensible of His presence and love, 
and the worst trials were as nothing in my sight, nor have been for over twenty-two years. While as for death, it appears only as a doorway into more abundant life, and I can alter an old German hymn and sing with joy, Oh, how my heart with rapture dances, to think my dying hour advances, then, Lord, with thee, my Lord, with thee. This is faith's triumph over the worst the world can offer through the blessed fullness of the indwelling Comforter. Bless his name. Here speaks the Comforter, light of the straying, hope of the penitent, advocate sure, joy of the desolate, tenderly saying, earth has no sorrow my grace cannot cure. End of chapter 20《ハプニングフォーティーリバイバル》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《When the Holy Ghost is Come》by Samuel Logan Brangle《Chapter Twenty One》The Overflowing Blessing Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. The children of Israel were instructed by Moses to give tithes of all that they had to the Lord, and in return God promised to richly bless them, making their fields and vineyards fruitful, and causing their flocks and herds to safely multiply. But they became covetous and unbelieving, and began to rob God by withholding their tithes, and then God began to withhold his blessing from them. But still God loved them and pitied them, and sent to them again and again by his prophets, and finally by the prophet Malachi he said, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3.10 he promised to make their barns overflow if they would be faithful, if they would pay their tithes and discharge their obligations to him. Now this overflow of barns and granaries is a type of overflowing hearts and lives when we give ourselves fully to God, and the blessed Holy Ghost comes in, and Jesus becomes all and in all to us. The blessing is too big to contain, but just bursts out and overflows through the life, the looks, the conversation, the very tones of the voice, and gladdens and refreshes and purifies everywhere it goes. Jesus calls it rivers of living water. John 7:38. There is the overflow of love. Sin brings in an overflow of hate, so that the world is filled with wars and murders, slanders, oppression, and selfishness. But this blessing causes love to overflow. Schools, colleges, and hospitals are built. Shelters, rescue homes, and orphanages are opened. Even war itself is in some measure humanized by the Red Cross Society and Christian commissions. Sinners love their own, but this blessing makes us to love all men, strangers, the heathen, and even our enemies. There is an overflow of peace. It settles old quarrels and grudges. It makes a different atmosphere in the home. Children know it when father and mother get the comforter. Kindly words and sweet good will take the place of bitterness and strife. I suspect that even the dumb beasts realize the overflow. I heard a laughable story of a man whose cow would switch her tail in his face and then kick over the pail when he was milking her. 
after which he would always give her a beating with the stool on which he sat but he got the blessing and his heart was overflowing with peace the next morning he went to milk that cow and when the pail was nearly full swish came the tail in his face and with a vivacious kick she knocked over the pail and then ran across the barnyard the blessed man picked up the empty pail and stool and went over to the cow which stood trembling awaiting the usual kicks and beating but instead he patted her gently and said you may kick over that pail as often as you please but i am not going to beat you any more and the cow seemed to understand for she dropped her head and quietly began to eat and never kicked again that story is good enough to be true and i doubt not it is for certainly when the comforter comes a great peace fills the heart and overflows through all the life there is an overflow of joy it makes the face to shine it glances from the eye and bubbles out in thanksgiving and praise you never can tell when one who has the blessing will shout out glory to god praise the lord alleluia amen i have sometimes seen a whole congregation wakened up and refreshed and made glad by the joyous overflow of one clean-hearted soul a salvation soldier or officer with an overflow of genuine joy is worth a whole company of ordinary folks he is a host within himself and is a living proof of the text the joy of the lord is your strength there is an overflow of patience and long-suffering a man got this blessing and his wicked wife was so enraged that she left him and went across the way and lived as the wife of his unmarried brother he was terribly tempted to take his gun and go over and kill them both but he prayed about it and the lord gave him the patience and long-suffering of jesus who bears long with the backslider who leaves him and joins himself with the world and he continued to treat them with the utmost kindness as though they had done him no wrong some people might say the man was weak but i should say he was unusually strong in the grace of our lord jesus christ and a neighbor of his told me that all his neighbors believed in his religion there is an overflow of goodness and generosity i read the other day of a poor man who supports eight workers in the foreign mission field when asked how he did it he replied that he wore celluloid collars did his own washing denied himself and managed his affairs in order to do it do you ask how can i get such a blessing you will get it by bringing in all the tithes by giving yourself in love and obedience and whole-hearted joyous consecration to jesus as a true bride gives herself to her husband do not try to bargain with the lord and buy it of him but wait on him in never give in prayer and confident expectation and he will give it to you and then you must not hold it selfishly for your own gratification but let it overflow to the hungry thirsty fainting world about you god bless you even now and do for you exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think a comrade went out from one of my meetings recently with a heart greatly burdened for the blessing and for two or three days and nights did little else but read the bible and pray and cry to god for a clean heart filled with the spirit 
at last the comforter came and with him fullness of peace and joy and soul rest and that day this comrade led a number of others into the blessing hallelujah if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the holy spirit to them that ask him luke eleven thirteen ask seek knock have ye received the holy spirit since ye believed end of chapter twenty one Chapter 22 of When the Holy Ghost Has Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dana Tucker. You can find him at www.yourpodcastreview.com. When the Holy Ghost Has Come by Samuel Logan Brindle. Chapter 22 importance of the doctrine and experience of holiness spiritual leaders ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you a mighty man inspires and trains other men to be mighty we wonder and exclaim often at the slaughter of goliath by david and we forget that david was the forerunner of a race of fearless invincible warriors and giant killers if we would in this light but study and remember the story of david's mighty men it would be most instructive to us moses inspired a tribe of cowering toiling wet-brimmed spiritless slaves to lift up their heads straighten their backs and throw off the yoke and he led them forth with songs of victory and shouts of triumph from under the mailed hand and iron bondage of pharaoh he fired them with a natural spirit and welded and organized them into a distinct and compact people that could be hurled with resistless power whence the superiority of these men. David was only a stripling shepherd boy when he was immortalized himself. What was his secret? To be sure, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and doubtless and had been trained in all the civil, military, and scientific learning of his day but he was so weak in himself that he feared and fled at the first word of questioning and disparagement that he heard and this was exodus two fourteen, and spent the next forty years feeding sheep for another man in the rugged wilderness of sinai what then was his secret doubtless they were men cast in a kinglier mold than most men but their secret was not in themselves. Joseph Parker declared that great lives are built on great promises, and so they are. These men had so far humbled themselves that they found God. They got close to him, and he spoke to them. He gave them promises. He revealed his way and truth to them, and trusting him, believing his promises, and fashioned their lives according to his truth, his doctrine everything else followed. They became workers together with God, heroes of faith, leaders of men, builders of empires, teachers of the race, and in an important sense, saviors of mankind. Their secret is an open one. It is the secret of every truly successful spiritual leader from then till now, and there is no other way to success in spiritual leadership. They had an experience. They knew God. This experience, this acquaintance with God, was maintained and deepened and broadened in obedience to God's teaching or truth or doctrine. They patiently yet urgently taught others what they themselves had learned and declared, so far as they saw it, the whole counsel of God. They were abreast from the deepest experiences and the fullest revelations God had yet made to man. They were leaders, not laggers. They were not in the rear of the procession of God's warriors and saints. They were in the forefront. 
Here we discover the importance of the doctrine and experience of holiness through the baptism of the Holy Spirit to Salvation Army leaders. We are to know God and to glorify Him and reveal Him to men. We are to finish the work of Jesus and fill up that which is behind the suffering of Christ. Colossians 1, 24. We are to rescue the slaves of sin, to make people, to fashion them in a holy nation, and inspire and lead them forth to save the world. How can we do this? Only by being in the forefront of God's spiritual host, not in name and not in titles only, but in reality. By being in glad procession of the deepest experiences God gives and the fullest revelations he makes to men. The astonishing military and naval success of the Japanese are said to be due to their profound study, clear understanding, and firm grasp of the theory, the principles, the doctrines of war, their careful and minute preparation of every detail of their campaigns. The scientific accuracy and procession from which they carried out their plans and their splendid and uttered personal devotion to their cause. Our war is far more complex and desperate than theirs, and its issues are infinitely more reaching, and we must equip ourselves for it. And nothing is so vital to our cause as the mastery of the doctrine and of assured and glorious procession of the Pentecostal experience of holiness through the indwelling Spirit. The Doctrine what is the teaching of God's Word about holiness? Number one, if we carefully study God's Word, we find that He wants His people to be holy, and the making of a holy people after the pattern of Jesus is the crowning work of the Holy Spirit. He commands us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 7. It is prayed that we may increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men to the end. He may establish your hearts unblameable in the holiness before God. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. He says, And he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversations, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. And in the most earnest manner, we are exhorted to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 7, 14. Number two. As we further study the word, we discover that holiness is more than simply freedom from condemnations from wrongdoing. A helpless invalid lying on his bed of sickness, unable to do anything wrong, may be free from the condemnation of actual wrongdoing, and yet it may be in his heart to do all manner of evil. Holiness on the negative side is a state of heart purity. It is heart cleanness, cleanness of thought and temper and disposition, cleanness of intention and purpose and wish. It is the state of freedom from all sin, both inward and outward. Romans 6, 18. On the positive side, it is a state of union with God in Christ, in which the whole man becomes a temple of God and filled with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It is moral and spiritual sympathy and harmony with God in the holiness of His nature. We must not, however, confound purity with maturity. Purity is a matter of the heart and it is secured by an instantaneous act of the Holy Spirit. Maturity is largely a matter of the head and results from growth in knowledge and experience. In one, the heart is made clean and is filled with love. In the other, the head is gradually corrected and filled with light, and so the heart is enlarged and more firmly established in faith. Consequently, the experience deepens and becomes stronger and more robust in every way. 
It is for this reason that we need teachers after we are sanctified. And to this end we are exhorted to humbleness of mind. Importance of Doctrine With a heart full of sympathy and a love for his family, my little boy may voluntarily go into the garden to weed the vegetables, but, being yet ignorant, lacking light in his head, he pulls up my sweet corn with the grass and weeds. His little heart glows with pleasure and pride in the thought that he is helping Papa, and yet he is doing the very thing I don't want him to do. But if I am a wise and patient father, I shall be pleased with him. For what is the loss of my few stalks of corn compared to the expression and development of his love and loyalty? And I shall commend him for the love and faithful purpose of his little heart, while I patiently set to work to enlighten the darkness of his little head. His heart is pure towards his father, but he is not yet mature. In this matter of light and maturity, holy people often widely differ, and this causes much perplexity and needless and unwise anxiety. In the 14th chapter of Romans, Paul discusses and illustrates the principle underlying this distinction between purity and maturity. Number 3. As we continue to study the Word under the illumination of the Spirit, who is given to lead us into all truth, we further learn that holiness is not a state which we reach in conversion. The apostles were converted. They had all forsaken all to follow Jesus. Matthew 14, 27, 29. Their names were written in heaven, Luke 20, and yet they were not holy. They doubted and feared, and again and again were they rebuked for their slowness and littleness of their faith. They were bigoted and wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume those who would not receive Jesus. Luke 9, 51 through 56. They were frequently contending among themselves as to which should be the greatest. And when the supreme test came, they all forsook him and fled. Certainly, they were not only affected with darkness in their heads, but far worse, carnality in their hearts. They were his, and they were very dear to him, but they were not yet holy. They were yet impure of heart. Paul makes this very clear in his epistle to the Corinthians. He tells them plainly that they were yet only babes in Christ because they were carnal and contentious. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. They were in Christ. They had been converted, but they were not holy. It is of great importance that we keep this truth well in mind, that men may be truly converted, may be babes in Christ, and yet not be pure in heart. We shall then sympathize more fully with them and see more clearly how to help them and guide their feet into the way of holiness and peace. Those who hold that we are sanctified wholly in conversion will meet with much to perplex them in their converts and are not intelligently equipped to bless and help God's little children. Number four, a continued study of God's teaching on this subject will clearly reveal to us that purity of heart is obtained after we are converted. Peter makes this very plain in his address to the council in Jerusalem, where he recounts the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius and his household. After mentioning the gift of the Holy Ghost, he adds, and puts no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Acts 15.9 Among other things, then, the baptism of the Holy Ghost purifies the heart, but the disciples were converted before they received this Pentecostal experience. So we see that heart purity, or holiness, is a work wrought in us after conversion. Again, we notice that Peter says, purifying their hearts by faith. 
if it is by faith then it is not by growth nor by works nor by death nor by purgatory after death it is god's work he purifies the heart and he does it for those and only those who devoting all their possessions and power to him seek him by simple prayerful obedient expect unwavering faith through his son our savior unless we grasp these truths and hold them firmly we shall not be able to rightly divide the word of truth we shall hardly be workmen that need not be ashamed approved unto god second timothy two fifteen someone has written that the searcher in science knows that if he but stumbles in his hypothesis that if he but let himself be betrayed into prejudice or undue learning towards a pet theory or anything but absolute uprightness of mind his whole work will be studified and will fail ignoramously to get anywhere in science he must follow truth with absolute rectitude the holy spirit and is there not a science of salvation of holiness of external life that requires the same absolute loyalty to the spirit of truth how infinitely important then that we know what the truth is that we may understand and hold that doctrine a friend of mine who furnishes his course with joy and was called into the presence of his lord to receive his crown some time ago has pointed out some mistakes which we must carefully avoid here they are. It is a great mistake to substitute repentance for Bible consecration. The people whom Paul exhorted to full sanctification were those who had turned from their idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son sent down from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, 3, 10 through 13, and verse 23 only people who are citizens of his kingdom can claim his sanctifying power those who still have idols to renounce may be candidates for conversion but not for the baptism of the holy ghost and fire it is a mistake in consecration to suppose that the person making it has anything of his own to give we are not our own but we are bought with a price and consecration is simply taking our hands off from God's property. To willfully withhold anything from God is to be a God robber. It is a mistake to substitute a mere mental asset to God's proprietorship and the right to all we have while withholding complete devotion to Him. This is theoretical consecration, a rock on which we fear multitudes will be wrecked consecration which does not embrace the crucifixion of self and the funeral of all false ambitions is not the kind which will bring the holy fire a consecration is imperfection which does not embrace the speaking faculty the tongue and the believing faculty the heart the imagination and every power of mind soul and body and give all absolutely and forever into the hands of Jesus, turning a deaf ear to every opposing voice. Reader, have you made such a consecration as this? It must embrace all this, or it will prove a bed of quicksand to sink your soul, instead of a full salvation balloon which will safely bear you above the fog and malaria and turmoil of the world where you can triumphantly sing. I rise to float in realms of light, above the world in sin, with heart made pure and garments white, and Christ enthroned within. It is a mistake to teach seekers to only believe without complete abandonment to God at every point, for they can no more do it than an anchored ship can sail. It is a mistake to substitute mere verbal assent 
or obedient trust. Only believe is a fatal snare to all who fall into these traps. It is a mistake to believe that the altar sanctifies the gift without the assurance that all is on the altar. If even the end of your tongue, or one cent of your money, or a straw's weight of false ambition or spirit of dictation, or one ounce of your reputation or will, or believing powers will be left off the altar, you can no more believe than a bird without wings can fly. Only believe is only for those seekers of holiness who are truly converted, fully consecrated, and crucified to everything but the whole will of God. Teachers who apply this to people who have not yet reached these stations need themselves to be taught. All who have reached them may believe, and if they do believe, may look God in the face and triumphantly sing. The blood, the blood, and on my plea, hallelujah, for it cleanseth me. Number two, the experience. Simply to be skilled in the doctrine is not sufficient for us as leaders. We may be as orthodox as St. Paul himself, and yet be only as sounding brass and clanging cymbals, unless we are rooted in the blessed experience of holiness. If we would save ourselves, and them that follow us, if we would make havoc of the devil's kingdom and build up God's kingdom, we must not only know and preach the truth, but we must be living examples of the saving and sanctifying power of the truth. We are to be living epistles, known and read of all men. We must be able to say with Paul, Follow me as I follow Christ. And those things which ye learned and received and heard and so on me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. We must not forget that, number one. We are ourselves simply Christians, individual souls struggling for eternal life and liberty, and we must by all means save ourselves. To this end, we must be holy, else we shall at last experience the awful woe of those who have preached to others and yet themselves castaways. Number two, we are leaders upon whom multiples depend. It is a joy and an honor to be a leader, but it is also a grave responsibility. James says, We shall receive the heavier judgment. James 3, 1, RV. How unspeakable shall be our blessedness, and how vast our reward, if, wise in the doctrine, and rich and strong and clean in the experience of holiness, we lead our people into their full heritage in Jesus. But how terrible shall our condemnation and how great our loss if, in spiritual slothfulness and unbelief, we stop short of the experience ourselves and leave them to perish for what of the gushing waters and heavenly food and divine direction we shall have brought them. We need the experience for ourselves, and we need it for our work and for our people. What the roof is to a house, that the doctrine is to our system of truth. It completes it. What sound and robust health is to our bodies, that the experience is to our soul. It makes us every whit whole and fits us for all duty. Weep away the doctrine, and the experience will soon be lost. Lose the experience, and the doctrine will surely be neglected, if not attacked and denied. No man can have the heart, even if he has the head, to fully and faithfully and constantly preach the doctrine unless he has the experience. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. 
And as this doctrine deals with the deepest things of the Spirit, it is only clearly understood, and it is best recommended, explained, defended, and enforced by those who have the experience. Without the experience, the presentation of the doctrine will be faulty and cold and lifeless, or weak and vacillating, or harsh and sharp and severe. With the experience, the preaching of the doctrine will be with great joy and assurance, and will be strong and searching, but at the same time, warm and persuasive and tender. I shall never forget the shock of mingled surprise and amusement and grief for which I heard a captain loudly announce in one of my meetings many years ago that he was going to preach holiness now, and his people have to get it. If he had to ram it down their throats, poor fellow, he did not possess the experience himself and never pressed into it and soon forsook his people. A man in a clear experience of the blessing will never think of ramming it down people, but will, with much secret prayer, constant mediation, and study, patient instruction, faithful warming, loving persuasion and burning, joyful testimony, seek to lead them into the entire and glad consecration and the fullness of faith that never failed to receive the blessing. Again, the most accurate and complete knowledge of the doctrine and to the fullest possession of the experience will fail us last unless we carefully guard ourselves at several points and unless we watch and pray. Number three, we must not judge ourselves so much by our feelings as by our violations. It is not my feelings, but the purpose of my heart, the attitude of my will, that God looks at. And it is that to which I must look. If our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence towards God. A friend of mine who had firmly grasped this thought and walked continually with God used to testify, I am just as good when I don't feel good as when I do feel good. Another mighty man of God said that all the feeling he needed to enable him to trust God was the consciousness that he was fully submitted to all the known will of God. We must not forget that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, Revelations 12, 10, and that he seeks to turn our eyes away from Jesus, who is our surety and our advocate to ourselves, our feelings, our infirmities, our failures, and if he succeeds in this, gloom will fill us. Doubts and fears will spring up within us, and we shall soon fail and fall. We must be wise as the conies, and build our nest in the cleft of the rock of ages. Hallelujah. Number four. We must not divorce conduct from character or works from faith. Our lives must square with our teaching. We must live what we preach. We must not suppose that faith in Jesus excuses us from patience, faithfulness, laborious service. We must live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That is, we must fashion our lives, our conduct, our conversation by the principles laid down in His Word, remembering His searching saying, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth dwell in the will of my Father, which is in heaven. This subject of faith and works is very fully discussed by James. Chapter 2, 14 through 26. And Paul is very clear in his teaching that, while God saves us not by our works, but by his mercy through faith. Yet it is that we may maintain good work. 
Titus 3, 14, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk with him. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Faith must work by love, and emotions must be transmitted into action, and joy must lead to work, and love to faithful, self-sacrificing service, else they become a kind of pleasant and respectable, but none the less deadly, debauchery, and at last run us. Number five. However, blessed and satisfactory our present experience may be, we must not rest in it. But remember that our Lord has yet many things to say unto us, as we are able to receive them. We must stir up the gift of God that is in us, and say with Paul, One thing I do, forgetting the things which were behind, and stretcheth forward as a racer, to the things to which, as before, I press onward the goal unto the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 13, 14, RV. It is at this point that many fail. They seek the Lord, they weep and struggle and pray, and then they believe, but instead of pressing on, they sit down to enjoy the blessing and lo, it is not. The children of Israel must needs follow the pillar of the cloud and fire. It made no difference when that moved. By day or by night, they followed. And when the Comforter comes, we must follow. If we would abide in him and be filled with all the fullness of God, and oh, the joy of following him. Finally, if we have the blessing, not the harsh, narrow, unprogressive exclusiveness which often calls itself by the sweet heavenly term of holiness, but the vigorous, courageous, self-sacrificing, tender, Pentecostal experience of perfect love. We shall both save ourselves and enlighten the world. Our converts will be strong. Our candidates for the work will multiply and will be able daredevil men and women, and our people will come to be like the brethren of Gideon, of whom it is said, each one resembled the child of a king. Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? End of chapter. Chapter 23 Victory Over Evil Temper by the Power of the Holy Spirit From When the Holy Ghost Is Come by S. L. Bringle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Lisa Goad. Two letters recently reached me, one from Oregon and one from Massachusetts, inquiring if I thought it possible to have temper destroyed. The comrade from Oregon wrote, I have been wondering if the statement is correct when one says, my temper is all taken away. Do you think the temper is destroyed or sanctified? It seems to me that if one's temper were actually gone, he would not be good for anything. The comrade from Massachusetts wrote, two of our corps cadets have had the question put to them, is it possible to have all temper taken out of our hearts? One claims it is possible. The other holds that the temper is not taken out, but God gives us power to overcome it. Evidently, these are questions that perplex many people, and yet the answer seems to me simple. Temper, as usually spoken of, is not a faculty or power of the soul, but is rather an irregular, passionate, violent expression of selfishness. When selfishness is destroyed by love, by the incoming of the Holy Spirit, revealing Jesus to us as an uttermost Savior, and creating within us a clean heart, of course such evil temper is gone just as the friction and consequent wear and heat of two wheels is gone when the cogs are perfectly adjusted to each other. The wheels are far better off without friction, and just so man is far better off without such temper. We do not destroy the wheels to get rid of the friction, 
but we readjust them that is we put them into just or right relations to each other and then noiselessly and perfectly they do their work so strictly speaking sanctification does not destroy self but it destroys selfishness the abnormal and mean and disordered manifestation and assertion of self i myself am to be sanctified rectified purified brought into harmony with god's will as revealed in his word and united to him in jesus so that his life of holiness and love flows continually through all the avenues of my being as the sap of the vine flows through all parts of the branch i am the vine ye are the branches said jesus when a man is thus filled with the holy spirit he is not made into a putty man a jellyfish with all powers of resistance taken out of him he does not have any less force and push and go than before but rather more for all his natural energy is now reinforced by the holy spirit and turned into channels of love and peace instead of hate and strife he may still feel indignation in the presence of wrong but it will not be rash violent explosive and selfish as before he was sanctified but calm and orderly and holy and determined like that of god it will be the wholesome natural antagonism of holiness righteousness to all unrighteousness and evil such a man will feel it when he is wrong but it will be much in the same way that he feels when others are wrong the personal selfish element will be absent at the same time there will be pity and compassion and yearning love for the wrongdoer and a greater desire to see him saved than to see him punished sanctified man was walking down the street the other day with his wife when a filthy fellow on a passing wagon insulted her with foul words instantly the temptation came to the man to want to get hold of him and punish him but as instantly the indwelling comforter whispered if ye will forgive men their trespasses and instantly the clean heart of the man responded i will i do forgive him lord and instead of anger a great love filled his soul and instead of hurling a brick or hot words at the poor devil deceived sinner he sent a prayer to god in heaven for him there was no friction in his soul he was perfectly adjusted to his lord his heart was perfectly responsive to his master's word and he could rightly say my temper is gone a man must have his spiritual eyes wide open to discern the difference between sinful temper and righteous indignation many a man wrongs and robs himself by calling his fits of temper righteous indignation while on the other hand there is here and there a timid soul who is so afraid of sinning through temper as to suppress the wholesome antagonism that righteousness to be healthy and perfect must express towards all unrighteousness and sin it takes the keen edged word of god applied by the holy spirit to cut away unholy temper without destroying righteous antagonism to enable a man to hate and fight sin with spiritual weapons second corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 through 5 while pitying and loving the sinner to so fill him with the mind of jesus that he will feel as badly over a wrong done to a stranger as though it were done to himself to help him to put away the personal feeling and be as calm and unselfish and judicial in opposing wrong as is the judge upon the bench into this state of heart and mind is one brought who is entirely sanctified by the indwelling holy spirit hallelujah dr asa mahan the friend and co-worker finney had a quick and violent temper in his youth and young manhood but one day he believed and god sanctified him and for fifty years he said he never felt but one uprising of temper and that was but for an instant about five years after he received the blessing for the following forty-five years though subjected to many trials and provocations he felt only love and peace and patience and goodwill in his heart a christian woman was confined to her bed for years with nervous and other troubles and was very cross and touchy and petulant at last she became convinced that the lord had a better experience for her and she began to pray for a clean heart full of patient holy humble love and she prayed so earnestly so violently that her family became alarmed lest she should wear her poor frail body out in her struggle for spiritual freedom but she told him she was determined to have the blessing if it cost her her life and so she continued to pray until one glad sweet day the comforter came her heart was purified and from that day forth in spite of the fact that she was still a nervous invalid suffering constant pain she never showed the least sign of temper or impatience but was full of meekness and patient joyous thankfulness Quote, 
love took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with might smote the chord of self that trembling passed in music out of sight End quote. such is the experience of one in whom jesus lives without a rival and in whom grace has wrought its perfect work no form of vice not worldliness not greed of gold not drunkenness itself does more to unchristianize society than evil temper says a distinguished and thoughtful writer if this be true it must be god's will that we be saved from it and it is provided for in the uttermost salvation that jesus offers do you want this blessing my brother my sister if so be sure of this god has not begotten such a desire in your heart to mock you you may have it god is able to do even this for you with man it is impossible but not with god look at him just now for it it is his work his gift look at your past failures and acknowledge them look at your present and future difficulties count them up and face them every one and admit that they are more than you can hope to conquer but then look at the dying son of god your savior the man with the seamless robe the crown of thorns and the nail prints look at the fountain of his blood look at his word look at the almighty holy ghost who will dwell within you if you but trust and obey and cry out it shall be done the mountain shall become a plain the impossible shall become possible hallelujah quietly intelligently abandon yourself to the holy spirit just now in simple glad obedient faith and the blessing shall be yours glory to god quote, have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed End quote. this is the end of chapter 23 and the end of the book when the holy ghost has come by s l bringle